It's a perfect winter's dawn in the historical West Australian town of Northam. And those first rays of light give an army of early risers a moment to take in the deceptive beauty of the river that winds through the town. For most on this particular morning, that moment is very brief. As an atmosphere of excitement and nervous adrenaline builds on the riverbank, Today is the day they have been waiting for all year, and soon the morning silence will erupt into action as hundreds of men and women take on one of the planet's great adventure challenges, the 45th annual Avon Descent. This year, as competitors eagerly prepare themselves and their craft, there is a mix of hardened veterans and ambitious novices bringing their passion and pride to the unique whitewater adventure. From the experienced... I'm now in my 34th year. Day I give up, today I don't enjoy it anymore. ...to the excited... This is our um, opportunity to be little kids again, I suppose. It's not serious for everyone, you know, we just like to... You know, get down the river and hopefully get to the finish and have some fun on the way, so yeah. So we're unlikely to get first place, but we'll certainly be the crowd pleaser along the way. <laughs> and the adventurous. My son decided he wanted to go on the Avon Descent, so we thought that we'd do a bonding experience. I could never relinquish my life to my son driving a boat. <laughs> now is the time the serious game begins. In front of them is two days and 124 kilometres of rocks, rapids and flat water obstacles, taking them from the wheat belt town of Northern all the way to the metropolis of Perth, Western Australia's shining capital. Day one will not be an easy ride, with 52 kilometres of natural obstacles and man-made hurdles to overcome before a well-earned break at Cobbler Pool, the finish point of the first day's adventure. Extracts is a nemesis. I'm a little bit nervous, just for extracts mainly. Got um, everything else down packed, but yeah, just the whole getting over the jump. And it was good, nice, not not um, foggy this morning, which is good. There'll be carnage down there at Northern Weir, guaranteed. There'll be at least five boats sitting there all parked up. At Williamson Weir, um, that'll be definitely a good place to watch, I would suggest. On day two, the race continues into the perils of the valley where both power and paddle test their metal through more than 70 churning rapids before hitting flat water and charging to the finish line in suburban Bayswater on the city's doorstep. There's quite a bit of water, so the rapids are going to be quite spectacular and a lot of fun to go down. First to take off from the riverbank are the power boats, the fast and furious of the competition. These guys and girls are the rock stars of the race. But the lead up to this year's event has been different for even the most experienced top finishers. Last year's fourth place finisher and one of the race fancies, Scott Goodbody, cutting it very fine. I think the flight landed at eight o'clock last night, jumped in the car and here we are. First sunlight I've seen in Perth for a while. Wouldn't miss this event if I could possibly avoid it, so stoked to be here. 2016's race provided some challenges for its third place getter, but for boat 144, the race this year was almost a write-off months earlier, due to a traumatic injury to one of the Avon's most iconic figures. I was riding uh, motorbikes, I, I ride a fair bit of enduro and uh, just having a nice leisurely ride and uh, went down doing about 100k an hour and belly flopped and broke my neck, back and sternum. Obviously at that point there wasn't much thought about having descent in eight months time but uh, after I got out of the hospital and then out of the brace and then was sort of talking to the doctors and about June we had a chat with the doctors and they were saying that I was fine and like my bones had healed and healed and I was right to go so then the decision got made that I might try and have a go at the Avon and and everything's gone really well and here I am so I'm absolutely over the moon. 
Last year's winner and this year's race favourites are revved up and ready to defend the title. The boys from boat 007 look to be shaken but not stirred all over again. We won it last year so we're going to have another crack at uh, trying to get from here to Bayswater the fastest. Today will be about trying not to lose ground on some of the other faster boats. There's a few spots where I'll uh, be giving it a nudge I'd say, taking some sporty lines. There is a collective roar from the engines as they're ready for the takeoff, sharply at 8am. Boat 144 of Jay Branson and David North makes it out cleanly, managing not to repeat last year's disaster at Northern Weir that almost put them out of the race at the first obstacle. Boats 007 and Hot Contender 100 make it out of Northern just as smoothly. But what happens in the pack behind them is another story entirely. After the trials of Northern Weir, it is a flat-out charge through a series of testing turns and on to one of the day's most daunting and dangerous obstacles, extracts, or as it is now known, Williamson Weir, a jagged, man-made wall of stone that gives even the most experienced of racers cause for concern. Approached at speed, any lapse in judgment could see you crashing onto rocks, ending your race, or possibly worse. As the main group of powerboats take off through extracts, the weir delivers on its promise of challenge and spectacle for competitors and spectators alike. For an unlucky few, the race ends here, but we will find out more on them a little later. Right now, we'll stay with the action as the race roars on. From Williamson Weir, the power craft cut down through the town of 2J and onto the notorious 2J Rapids. With water levels up this year, it's a smooth run for most. But as race history tells us, not for all. The final obstacle in their path are the notorious tea trees, a natural maze of living obstacles that grow and change each year causing headaches and issues of plenty for even the most talented of racers. It takes every bit of skill and intuition to get through unscathed and on to the day one finish at Cobbler Pool. Coming up, the fastest and the most furious, the finishers and the failures and the paddlers put the muscle into the morning, taking off for a punishing day one. With the powerboats racing ahead, it's time for the paddlers to launch themselves into the fray and onto the river, beginning their first 52-kilometre stage of the Avon Odyssey, powered only by mind and muscle. For some, what lies ahead is a familiar challenge. This is my sixth Avon descent, so yeah, tried not very smart. I don't learn my lesson. I come back every year. Day one is generally just a just a slog. And others are open to the adventure. This is my first Avon descent, and I'm pretty nervous this morning, but should be all good. <laughs> just not knowing how quick the water's running. Like I just haven't even sat in the water here yet. Paul Genovese and David Worthy have chalked up decades of Avon experience together and like many others, are drawn back every year to take on the challenges of the race and the river. It's a fantastic local event. It's the Olympics of paddling in Western Australia. 
I think you should do it for as long as you want to and as long as you can. It's a really tough event and anybody who finishes it is a winner. And the excitement of the families and support teams is just as energetic as the competitors. We're supporting my uncle and my dad. And I think he'll go really well because I think he's in first grade, so I wish him luck, yeah. The line honour contenders are first to take off. And away they go, ladies and gentlemen. 124 kilometres in racing. This year, the 2016 top two solo racers have teamed up to take on the river. But double the manpower also means double the racing intensity. We decided that we were going to race each other so hard if we did solo that it was probably easier to team up and that would give us the best performance. One by one, the paddle craft streaked towards Northern Weir, the obstacle that delivered mixed success for their powerboat friends. This is only the first of the challenges but it proves once again to be one of the most arduous. The event's first ever stand-up paddler, Paul Ranger, has everyone wondering whether he will finish the 124 kilometers on his feet, or will the labyrinth of rock-filled rapids turn his weekend into an exercise in pain and futility. All eyes are on him as he approaches Northern Weir. With a start like this, it may be the latter, but there's a long way to go, and maybe a slow and steady approach will get him to the end. Next up is Williamson Weir, the rock face that caused so much chaos for the power craft. Even the most experienced have come undone, taking on this rocky obstruction. And with water levels higher than last year, there are no guarantees of a clean run. Kayak duo Dean and Morfitt are the first to the weir. With twice the power of their solo paddling friends, they could be the ones to beat. Craft after craft pass over the wall of rock using a variety of techniques, some less elegant than others. After extracts, there's still the spectre of 2J Rapids to get past. And the river lives up to its reputation as one by one, our lineup of human-powered heroes takes on the swirling whitewater challenge. With the rapids behind them, they reach the twisted tangle of the tea trees. This is no place for the faint of heart. Many a race has been lost here, and the need for speed must be tempered with caution if they want to make it to the finish in a competitive position. This unpredictable stretch of river takes a large toll on the paddlers, just as it did the power boats. With different water levels each year changing the course, racers can be easily confused and sent down the wrong path from which there is often no return. Down river, the speed freaks roar to the finish line at Cobbler Cool. It is one of the fastest ever day one finishes, and very little separates the top contenders. Taking line honours is something boat 144 hadn't seriously expected, but a masterclass in skill and daring got them across the line first, with only seconds separating the top teams. Hot on their rudder were defending champions Michael Prosser and Perrin Franks, just 11 seconds behind with Justin Green and Scott Goodbody third. Nice and smooth run down the river. I was the first boat home and unofficially I got only a very small lead over Michael Prosser, so he's a class competitor, so it'll be interesting. It was a lot of fun, it's quite fast. One spectacular section, as I suggested it might have been, was um, Williamson Weir. And uh, it's quite a drop and it's, it's quite a buzz to go off, actually. I'm pretty happy to have gotten down there quite fast without damaging them. There's a lot that can happen tomorrow, it's a big day.
Williams and Weir certainly left a mark on the boys in orange, but it wasn't enough to wipe the smiles from their faces. We were uh, shooting down the river. Last year we did a big jump over extracts, great takeoff, bad landing to rocks, so we decided to do a little differently this year. And this is the end result. So Blade's missing, it's supposed to have three. And this one's been mashed at the same time. Tomorrow we are going to go as fast as we possibly can down the river for as long as we possibly can. So a great day out. It isn't long before those who manage to finish day one start to hit the bank at the Cobbler Pool overnight camp. A few guys had a few missets in the two trees and they'll be in later. <laughs> Boat racing is just, com uh, it's completely unique. Tomorrow the valley is just gonna be an absolute blast, eh? With the times so tight between the leading power boats, the race to the line on day two will be as intense as it gets. Coming up, the paddler craft surge and glide exhausted to the day one finish. And there is a drama ahead for the team at the top. Hot pace was set for the Paddler's Day 1's finish line with Josh Kippen, last year's single kayak winner and South African-born Brendan Rice, racing in relay to cover the 52-kilometre stretch from Northern Weir to Cobbler's Pool, west of 2J, in three hours, 29 minutes, 25 seconds. It's a bit of a different kind of hurt as well. You're, you're a bit more, sort of, it's, it's a bit harder on you, really. The intensity is a lot higher. Doing teams, it's more like a time trial. You're really trying to collect every second along the way that you can. Arriving first, they are already thinking of tomorrow. Brennan's going to paddle the whole valley. It'll be a case of maybe a bit of racing amongst amongst a group for a while and then and then try and hopefully get away if I can at some stage and set Josh up. We set today up very well um, and that's always a strategy for an Avon is have a good day one, get yourself a bit of a buffer. That gives you a sort of safety net through the valley and you pretty much just have to finish with everybody else tomorrow and you win. The first double kayak of Matt Dean and James Morfitt with 13 minutes behind them. It was, it was definitely a tough day, but, but the water levels definitely played to our advantage today, so yeah, we're happy. Every year is a different year, um, different water levels and different competition. The other one's definitely WA's white water race, I guess you could call it, yeah. Definitely the longest, definitely the hardest. Yeah. It's really nice to, to come across first, but like I said, tomorrow is, tomorrow is the biggest day, so having a little bit of a lead towards the, the second day is nice to have. But I felt really comfortable until the tea trees. The water's changed a little bit over the last couple of days, and I made one mistake through the trees. It cost me probably 30 seconds. You paddle through such scenic pieces coming through the valley, and then you've got all these supporters halfway down, and everybody's cheering you on. It's just really nice to, to have that support. Anything can happen tomorrow. We've got a whole valley and hundreds of rapids and, you know, one or two swims and it's all, all a different ball game. As the finishers start to stream in, some well-known faces are amongst them, including Daryl Long, veteran of 30 Avon descents. This year adding to his repertoire by competing in a ski. I'm still staying in the competitive bunch, so, you know, as long as you're up the front, and that it's um, worthwhile coming back because if you're just struggling at the back, then it wouldn't be, wouldn't be fun, you know. One to watch is Jason Graham, who has travelled all the way from South Africa to take on the river for the first time. It went really well. Um, I, I think I probably started a bit hard. It's a maze out there, and it's it's really difficult to to tell where to go. There's no real reading of the river through the tea trees. Now I'm really scared of tomorrow to be honest because today was 52 k's tomorrow 72 k's and for the last 20 k's today i was a broken man already as many a racer says anything can happen on day two and with the valley ahead it will be a mix of supreme skill and blind luck that shapes the leaderboard at the end of the race while the paddle craft continue to dribble into camp it's time to assess the damage day one has inflicted and make essential repairs to last another 72 kilometres of hardcore West Australian terrain. But there is one more competitor to come. Within mere minutes of day one cutoff, Paul Ranger, still standing, cruises in almost eight and a half hours after he started. It is a very long time to be floating on your feet let alone taking on one of the world's longest whitewater challenges. 
As the sun sets in the valley, it's time to relax, repair, recuperate, and reflect on the day's events. Disappointingly for some, this will be where their race ends. Well, we came into Axe Drax and we came in probably a little bit too hot and then we sort of launched off the first rocks and then into the next ones and then she came out and hit her knee badly. I didn't really realise at first that she was floating in the water and I thought she just caught her leg, which often happens in these races. And before I knew it, the rescue was over there and they pulled her over to the side. They put her in the boat. And even then, it just looked like she had a, a bruise on her knee. And um, then they cut the wetsuit away. It ended up being, you know, like four or five inches long, the, the cut in her leg. So I think she had 10 internal stitches and then some more on the outside again. Sadly for brothers Noah and Nick, they won't be hitting the water either. We had a pretty average run down Northern Weir. We got down the weir all right. We took a right, took a left, and then there was a boat smack in the middle of the channel, and we tried to miss them, and we found a tree stump. He instantly thought he had broken his wrist, and we sort of said, well, do you want to pull out? And he said, well, he wanted to keep going. It's a spiral fracture through the middle of my hand. After that happened, we basically jumped straight back in the boat and continued on and completed the rest of the day. We got told we can't race, so we're a bit, bit bummed out by that. But father and son team 142 can't wait to get back in. Today was more about just trying to get here safely, un unscathed, and set us up for tomorrow. Um, to be in first place, well, that's just a bonus. No, no crashes, that's the main thing. If you don't crash and just keep moving forward, you should, yeah, you should do well. The Avon Descent Overnight Camp is as special as the race. The one time per year among all the competitions that racers and their support teams really have a moment to come together. Cobbler Pool Campsite, it's the halfway point or the overnight camp. It's not just a race, the whole thing is an event. And the big attraction of the Avon and what makes the Avon you know, so special is the valley, what, we, what they just call the valley, the Avon Valley. There's so many rapids down there, that's the challenge, that's why most people, I, I believe, go in the Avon. One day a year, they get to do the valley, and it's so special. Tonight, there is a lot of celebration for a successful day one for many. But those who have waged many a campaign on the Avon know how easily things can change on day two. The river and its conditions are never constant. It is clear that it is the challenges of the valley weighing on their minds. Next, the action of day two kicks off and the unpredictable Avon once again takes its toll on the paddlers and power boats alike and the possible undoing of one of the race favourites. As the athletes prepare to enter the water on the second day, they are already mindful of what is ahead. The valley, it's cold, bitterly cold to start on these mornings um, and the, the rapids are always exciting but can be a bit of drama too. This morning I'm feeling pretty uh, exhausted from yesterday. The, the valley section is going to be hard but that flat water at the end is also something that looms in the back of your mind too. This morning I'm feeling pretty wrecked. Uh, yesterday took it out of me, it was my first ever Avon. So uh, definitely some sore bones this morning and uh, the drive here was sore enough, never mind the paddle. The most exciting thing about the day two is the rapids. I'm calm and excited, I'm, I'm looking forward just to get in there and, and, and get wet and get, get through that first rapid. It's a sharp start at 7am, beginning with the fastest finishes of day one. And wave after wave of muscle-powered craft of all kinds head off from the overnight camp at Cobbler Pool. There is one team who, despite finishing in the top two of their class on day one, may have their chances to take on the valley ruined through no fault of their own. Disappointingly, we arrived this morning to find our boat had been moved from where we left it. Picked it up, turned it over. Dave, my partner, Dave Woody, said, the seats are gone. I said, what? He said, where are our seats? I said, I don't know. Missing wing nuts holding together vital parts of the craft have also come out. 
leaving the team to desperately hunt for replacement parts if they are to have any chance. The back footbar's loose, and that's where the pumps are. So even if we had had the seats in and, found, and we'd have taken off and the back footbar would have popped out. I mean, James Morfitt, the leading double craft, uh, actually gave me some wing nuts to help me out. We'll, we'll try to scrounge a couple of seats and get on the water when we can, um, but our chances are gone. Just really, really gutted. We've now got to fight our way through the field, and um, that's one thing we're very good at, is fighting. David Worthy makes the 30-minute drive to Gijiganup to borrow some seats. How long it will take for him to return and whether they will fit is still in question. All Paul Genovese can do is wait. The remaining paddlers hit the river and head off down the valley, including Paul Ranger, the stand-up paddler, aiming to write his own record in Avon history. To reach the torrents of the valley, the competitors must first get out of the base camp the way they entered, through another treacherous stretch of tea trees. Beyond that is the fast-paced super chute, a narrow, twisting channel of fast-flowing water rushing and descending down between solid rock walls. Once they have made it through the super chute, the spectre of Emu Falls looms large in the distance. Another even more dangerous natural test of skill and temper. Emu Falls never fails to take its toll on the fleet. Many a racer's dreams have been shattered here, and this year will be no exception. And it appears there will still be one new record to be written as our stand-up hero, Paul Ranger, retires not long after the rapids at Strong Hills Farm. Well, there's always next year. As those who are left power on to Bell's Rapids, the final hurdle in the valley, the water level lifts them to new heights and they rush through the valley's lower reaches without too many major spills. Now, the final flat water slog to the finish is in front of them. Back at Cobbler Pool, Paul Genovese and David Worthy hurry to reassemble their kayak. But will the frustration being unfairly forced to take on the valley in a hastily cobbled together substandard craft be too much for them? Only time will tell. Go. More than an hour has passed since the first grid departed. When Team 647, Paul and Dave, were meant to start. After a few practice turns in the river, they decide to continue but will their makeshift repairs hold out for the entire 72 kilometres of wild white water and the punishing push to the finish? Midday soon arrives and it's time for the power boats to begin the chase down the valley. 
With mere seconds separating the lead pack, it is still anyone's race to be won or lost. With both 144 aiming for line honours again and the overall title, it is a desperate race through the tea trees to keep ahead. A lapse in concentration almost has their race in ruin, or at least opens the door to their closest rivals. The chase is on in earnest with boat 007 hot on the heels of 144. within striking distance of the lead, 007 takes a bad turn at Moondyne Rapids. Leaving them high and dry and urgently making repairs. Hold on to my jacket and pull it over. Whoa, whoa. This mishap will cost them many vital seconds as the field begins to speed past them. This year, there is a new honour to be won, the King of the Valley, for the fastest powerboat from Cobbler Pool to Bells Rapids. And there's no shortage of challengers lining up to take that crown, but the winner of this title won't be revealed until the end of the race. Back in the water. Careful the prop. Having relaunched with a quick repair, boat 007 is once again hunting down the leaders through the remaining rapids. There are some close calls as they chase down the leaders, trying to avoid obstacles protruding from the water. At this speed, one distraction, one minor error in judgment, can have a devastating effect on your result. And sometimes, even power needs to paddle. The speed freaks smash their way down the valley, taking on the trials of emus and bells. Every turn a potential error, every rapid a disaster waiting to happen. Such is the speed of the power craft, they quickly catch the tail end of the paddle craft field, working hard, and surge past, leaving them in their wake. Coming up, the race to the line, and the aftermath of another incredible Avon adventure. The 
field has finally put the trials of the valley behind them, and now the focus is to take on the final flat water stage through the suburbs of Perth all the way to Bayswater. While one event reaches a climax, another event, this time for future generations, is just beginning, 15 kilometres from the finish line. The Avon Challenge gives aspiring future competitors a taste of what is to come. Not long after the juniors hit the shore at Bayswater, the first marathon paddlers slide up the beach. With duo marathon kayak team, Morford and Dean taking the division title. Uh, we left Cockers Pool this morning and decided to be a bit conservative off the start, keep a bit of fuel in the tank and I think that paid off. Yeah, it's a few tough lines, had a bit of water in the front of the boat that we couldn't get rid of, so made it a bit hard for steering, a bit slow to get around the corners, but yeah, Smiley did really well to get us down the valley, and no swims or anything like that, so yeah, really happy, eh? Yeah, yeah so I had a, a big mishap. Uh, I put a proper big hole in my boat, so I sort of pulled up, taped around my boat a few times, and it was enough to, to get down the rest of the valley with it. You know, I don't really know what goes on in the valley, so I'm kind of sitting there at Bells, and then it was my job to get us back up the front again. Finishing first in the singles was Jason Graham. Wow, I, I'd say that it was an amazing experience. I, I'd say today, just because of the sheer distance, was probably the single hardest day of paddling in my life because I was really tired, really, really, really a broken man. I got a bit emotional at the finish because just to see my little girl and my wife, yeah, it's just been an amazing experience all around. <laughs> William Lee took out second place in the solo kayak marathon after having a healthy lead on day one, but none of that seemed to matter at the finish. Oh, I had a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic day. Really happy with my day. Coming on the finish, you know, you're so tired and you've got hundreds of people on the bank just cheering you on, so really, really nice event. Like I said, always, when you finish it, you don't think you're gonna come back, but you always come back. We had a really good day. It was, uh, the water was fantastic. We, uh, we're really happy with how we went down the valley. It's all, I mean, the hands. Guns out there in front of Yeah, it was. Very sore. We're thrilled, and the water level was great, so uh, we had a good time. Yeah, I'm glad we finished, that's all I can yeah. say. And we beat the powerboat, so I'm always, uh, that's always a good thing when you come in before they do. Yeah, sensational event, you know, getting up to Northern and 2J over the weekend, so yeah. best part of, you know, Perth in the winter. It certainly has been a marathon effort, with the team of Kippen and Rice being the fastest over the two-day time trial, followed by the double trouble of Morford and Dean, and first solo kayaker Jason Graham making up ground and passing the lead established by William Lee on day one. Word is relayed down the river that powerboats are on their way. But just who is leading isn't clear, and the fast and furious scramble for position reaches fever pitch on the flat water through Middle Swan. And it's not long before the familiar roar of engines fills the air, and boat 144 with Jay Branson comes in sight. They may have powerboat line honours, but were they the fastest overall across the two days? We beat it up down the valley, had a fat time. The river today was spectacular. Starting day two, only 11 seconds behind, boat 007 opened the door for an exhilarating chase. We were going great guns. We caught up to the lead boat, which was Jay, very, very quickly. And I had just a hell of a time trying to get past him. I was following and it's very difficult to see what's coming up ahead when you're so close behind another boat. And I was trying everything to get past him uh, and I just didn't get it quite right. Glanced off a branch and over we went. Spent a good amount of time on the bank getting the motor going again. And uh, yeah, I guess we made up some ground for the rest of the stretch. Yeah, just gave it everything we had to come down to the bottom. While the celebrations of line honours continue, 
The times across the two days are tallied to determine the overall race winners. It's a painful wait. I don't know who's won actually. It'd be very, very close. Got hit by five seconds. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Next year then. <laughs> Known as one of the bridesmaids of the Avon descent, Scott Goodbody once again finishes high in the rankings, but being part of the race is sometimes what matters more. Very, very awesome. Like, it was wicked water level. We had an absolute hoop. Uh, we had a bit of a doozy early on, which slowed us down a bit, but uh, it was just an absolute ball. We're at Emus and uh, coming down just the... It's called the Shredder before the Emus, and we stalled the motor at the top of it. So it's something we'd drive down, but then we had to dawdle down it. We saw quite a few boats during the day, and it's so close. Everyone's just really on the money. It's amazing. It's good to see. With the two-day time trial results now in, the announcement is made, and the team of Jay Branson and David North in boat 144 has come out on top. Less than five seconds behind them, Last year's champions, Michael Prosser and Perrin Franks, followed by Nick Gardner and Matthew Even. While coming fourth overall, taking the title and prize for King of the Valley was boat 167, Matt Thur and Jake Watley. Their boat roared down the valley from Cobbler Pool to Bells Rapids in an amazing time of just 50 minutes and 31 seconds. As the emotions and relief sweep over the finishers, some of the most determined competitors are welcomed with cheers on the Bayswater beach. Despite starting more than one hour behind the pack, kayak duo Paul and Dave's sheer will has allowed them to finish fourth fastest over the two days and second in their class. They are a clear example of the passion this event is all about. At the end of the day, we're here. We just had to do what we could. Well, I was gutted this morning. I um, actually nearly gave up, but luckily I've got this guy in the back who's not only a strong paddler, he's a strong character. And I owe it to Paul, like, to push me. So we achieved what we needed to do, and we uh, had some adversary, and we've overcome it and that's what matters. And so that caps off another year of the 124 kilometre whitewater spectacular that is the Avon Descent. Each year brings new and different challenges and new and different challengers from around the world. With new generations of competitors, new categories of racing and new records to be written, we can hardly wait for the 2018 Avon Descent to begin. Just give it a go. If it's, if it's on your bucket list, um, join a club, start paddling and just, just get in there and do it. And you might not make it the first time, you might not get to the end the first time, but you'll eventually get there and it's a whole lot of fun, so it's definitely worth doing. Some faces we are certain to see again next year. The Avon Valley is one of the most beautiful and picturesque places in, in Western Australia. And to be able to actually paddle down the river and see parts of it that you just can't access by foot is just absolutely incredible. It, it's just such a beautiful area. And that's one of the things that keeps me coming back.